My name is Matt Rabel, and I'm an old-fashioned Java developer. I'm a hick from the sticks. I grew up in the backwoods of Montana with no electricity, no running water. I had to walk two miles to the bus stop every day, and yes, it was uphill both ways. I have a strange obsession with Volkswagens, particularly vans and buses. I'm happy to say that this one's done after 10 years of being restored, and uh, Porsche engine and everything, it rocks. It's fun to drive. So what about you? Are you or do you consider yourself a Java developer? Well, you've got to raise your hand. Okay, that's like three quarters of the room. Um, if you've been doing web development for more than 20 years, put your hand up. 20 years, that's 1996. 10 years, 2006. Okay, um, five years. What about just a couple years? Last couple years you started, okay. So I've been doing it for 20 years. I actually started writing my first web pages in, uh, I think, 1994. Um, so I've been doing it a while. Um, how many people like JSF? If you're a job developer, you've done web development. We've got the most I've ever seen at a conference. That's four folks. Four people, five, like JSF. How many people like GWT or GWT? One. Two. We've got two. How many people like JavaScript? That's like half the room. So if you asked at a Java conference five years ago, hardly any hands would have went up, right? So JavaScript has kind of taken over for web development and JavaScript MVC frameworks. And people, whether they liked it or not, probably not, have had to you know, learn JavaScript. So if you've been doing web development for as long as I have, um, you're probably not that hip. Do you want to be a hip Java developer? How many people want to get hip? That's why you came here. That's what I like to see. So to be a hip Java developer, the first thing that you need to do is start using Java 8. That's pretty easy. How many people are stuck on Java 7? It's about 10 or 15, maybe 20. How many people are stuck on WebSphere? Oh, you poor bastard. I'm sorry. If you, if you would like some whiskey, come on up. I mean, I'll help you out. So in Java 8, we got a bunch of new stuff that's really cool. Parallel collections, JSR 310 date and time API. You can get rid of Joe to time. Still an awesome library, but the 310 date and time API is developed by the same guy. Functional interfaces with default methods, Lambda expressions. Um, you get to use arrows. They look cool. And you can even run JavaScript on the JVM. And people are, are making great strides and making that work. So let's define what a hipster is. A hipster is one who is exceptionally aware of or interested in the latest trends and tastes. So in Java land, annotations aren't that new, but they're a whole lot better than XML. But now guess what we have? Instead of XML hell, we have annotation hell. So who knows what the next thing will be, but you know they've gotten us better than before. We have environments with dev, test, and production. We have microservices. Um, all the rage now is container list deployment, right? You embed Tomcat into your application instead of deploying your application to Tomcat. And monitoring, it's important to see the health of your application and know when things are failing. So Spring has had one of the best track records in Java land for being hip. With Spring Boot, they've kind of taken it and lowered the barrier to entry so you can very easily get started with a new application with Spring Boot, and you don't have to basically configure a bunch of XML or add a bunch of annotations. So you can create standalone Spring applications with Spring Boot. You can use Undertow, Jetty, or Tomcat directly. They give you a bunch of opinionated starter problems or even Maven dependencies, and basically make it so instead of having 20 or 30 dependencies in your project, you'll just have their very few that they've said, hey, we figured out how to make Spring MVC work with JAX-RS. Just add this you know, one or two lines, and you're good to go. They also support and promote using Gradle. So it's not just you know, Maven, it's also Gradle. And that's hip. So they automatically configure Spring whenever possible, um, provide production-ready features such as metrics, health checks, and externalized configuration. I was on a project for a client where the only thing that they really wanted was externalized configuration. And so since they were using Spring and they hadn't used Spring Boot, this was like three years ago, I was able to slip Spring Boot in and be like, hey, we just need the externalized configuration. And then you know, we started using it more and more. There's no code generation and no requirement for XML configuration. So this is a vast departure from Spring Roo, which was one of their projects that they had that did 
you know, the code generation, and uh, they eventually pass that on. There's another team maintaining it, but they aren't sponsored by Pivotal. And Grails 3.0 is based on Spring Boot. So if you want to get started with Spring Boot, it's pretty easy. You just go to Spring Initializer, start.spring.io, and uh, you can even curl it if you want, or HTTP Pi is a new command line tool that I've been using, works really well. Um, or even in IntelliJ, you can do new project and point to Spring Initializer and make all your choices in there so you don't even have to go to a web browser. So how many people don't know about Spring Boot? We got one. We got two. Okay, so I have a Spring Boot demo, but in the interest of time, I'm going to skip it since most of you already know about Spring Boot. Josh Long is going to be here tomorrow. Um, I don't know about Friday, but he does an excellent Spring Boot demo. So if you want to learn more about Spring Boot, I'd suggest you go there. I'll show some of it to you today, but since everyone you know, kind of already knows it, we'll skip it. It basically very easily, you create a new project. There's hardly anything in it. You can add a repository. You can add an entity. And it basically ends up being like 80 lines of code, and you have a whole REST service um, talking to a database, and it all just works. And it even does uh, fast reload. It doesn't even um, make you restart the server. Um, there's a dev tools project that's part of Spring Boot that reloads and compiles your Java classes when you change them. So it's kind of like JRebel. Right, you've heard of that, and, uh, but it you know, does it in a Spring Boot project. So, latest trends in web development. But before I do that, I'm starting to feel pretty hip just talking about Spring Boot. So I'm going to change my old stodgy shoes to some Converse here. Notice they match the bus. So I wear them at shows. Kind of hard to put on shoes, though. It's like as you get older, one of the hardest things to do. You need to do more yoga. So web development trends, we got JavaScript MVC framework. So those have kind of taken the world by storm, right? And if you think about it, AngularJS, holy cow, that thing came out in, what, 2010? Six years later, we're still using the same web framework? Like, that's hardly happened. PHP, I guess. That's, what, 15 years? So that's still happening. Not very hip, though. Um, CSS3 with animations. Um, that's a great tool to use once you learn how to use it. And it's, uh, it's interesting, because to use animations with CSS, a lot of times what you have to do is you have to add the CSS class and then remove it, and add it and remove it. So if you've done CSS3 animations, you'll know. Um, a lot of libraries, animation.css makes it real easy to do if you want to just you know, use someone else's library. And mobile first. We're developing for mobile first. And the beauty of doing mobile first is you actually reduce what your application does. So if someone sees it on a phone, they know that, hey, we need to limit our options. They see it on a desktop, they're like, we need a button here, we need a button here, we need a drop down menu here, we need a right click functionality here. But on a phone, first of all, there's no right click. Second of all, there's no drag and drop. So you've eliminated like two features that aren't that much fun to implement. And uh, it's just a better way of developing applications. You can, of course, scale up to a desktop to give it more features, but it's cool to start with limited features. And even now, they're talking about offline first. That's not very easy, um, but it is you know, the next big thing in apps, and they're calling it progressive web apps. But those basically, instead of you know, being mobile only first, it's offline first, so you actually fire it up, and it works as long as you've vis visited the site once. And then front-end optimization. I can't tell you how many clients I've been to where they ask me to speed up their back-end. Right? They're like, hey, this, this page takes a while to load, and we're having some optimization problems, so can you do some performance tuning, check out our back end, check out our database, and see what's wrong there. And I do profiling, you know, gather some metrics, and then a lot of times it ends up that 50% of the slowness is the UI. It's not even the back end. It's the UI, and on single page applications, it's just that initial load. So you know, once you get past that, it's not a big deal. Um, but you know, front end optimization by gzipping and expires headers, concatenating files and stuff like that, it's huge. And the gzipping and expires headers are often you know, the biggest things that make the biggest impact. And REST APIs. REST APIs are, are certainly popular and ubiquitous now. Um, there's a bunch of companies trying to convince us that reactive APIs are the next big thing. Um, might happen. But AngularJS is one of the hottest, if not the hottest, JavaScript MVC framework. If you look at Google Trends, they prove it. If you look at Ember, or React, or Knockout, or Backbone, which you don't hear about much anymore. It's just 
eclipsed them. It's left them in the dust. So wouldn't it be hip if someone took the coolest things in web development land, the coolest things in Java land, and married them together? Well, the good news is Julian Dubois and his hip team did it. Jay Hipster, baby. And they added Bootstrap. Bootstrap is the thing that we always wanted as web developers. It's what JSF tried to do, in my opinion. They said, we need web components, and we need the ability, Flex did a good job, to actually plop a grid on a page or have a nav bar or something like that. And little did we know, what we really wanted was CSS and HTML structures that let us do that kind of thing. And granted, there's no state like there is with JSF, but we want stateless applications anyway, so it kind of you know, just makes everything work a little better. So jhipster is basically an application generator. So these things are popular at conferences, and they do well in demos. But in the real world, it can be tough to use them because how often are you creating a new application? Not that often, right? You're usually maintaining an existing application. Maybe you created it with Angular a couple years ago. Maybe you have Spring Boot in there, and maybe you are doing something similar to jhipster. So one of the greatest things about it is you can generate an application and just learn from it. You don't have to use it, but see how we're doing things and see how you know, things are blended together and you can learn a lot from that. So they use, uh, you know, it's a single pa web page application, responsive web design, HTML5 boilerplate, Angular's in there, Angular translates in there for internationalization. Um, you can use SAS support if you want, um, WebSocket support with Spring WebSocket if you want, and it uses Yeoman to do the whole web development workflow thing. And then testing with Karma, um, uses Gulp, and uh, uses Timeleaf too. If you want to do an actual server-side application, there is Timeleaf built in and you can do that. Um, but we just don't generate the actual stack or the CRUD entities for you if you're doing that that way. So there's some foundational frameworks, Spring Boot, Spring Security, AngularJS, Bootstrap, and Metrics. And then when you're creating a project, you can choose between Maven or Gradle. For authentication, you can do cookie-based regular session where you know, it stores a session on the server. Or stateless, JWT or OAuth2. You can have SQL or NoSQL database, EHCache or Hazelcast for caching, Elasticsearch, and then Gulp.js. Uh, we did have an option for Grunt or Gulp, um, but people weren't really using Grunt, and it kind of went on the wayside, and it's a little slower than Gulp, so we just ditched it. Um, we do have a way to add it back in, but no one in the community seemed interested, so we're not interested either. So Yeoman is a workflow and basically has three types of tools for improving your productivity. Um, the scaffolding tool, Yo, and they have a bunch of generators there. There's 500 or 1,000 where you can type Yo whatever, and it generates you an app. So what a cool name for a command, right? Yo, generate me an app. The build tool, um, Grunt or Gulp, um, and people are starting to move towards NPM, so that's a thing now too. And a package manager, like Bower or NPM, or Browserify. And as we're getting into Angular too, that's changing too, because with, with Bower, it typically pulls down you know, single JavaScript files and then puts them in your page, and they're globally available. But now that people are getting the modules with ES6, um, that's not the same sort of paradigm. So um, we'll likely be moving away from that as we add Angular 2 support. So you get easy installation, new JavaScript libraries for AngularJS, um, live reload with uh, Browser Sync, and testing with Carmen PhantomJS. How many people have not heard of Browser Sync? Okay, so we got like 10 of you. And do all of you do web development? Like you're in a browser most of the day? So you might use something else like live reload, but basically the whole idea is that you never have to hit refresh on your browser. So it detects when files change, reloads your browser for you. I mean, that could save you five minutes a day, maybe 10. So there you go. Talk's over. Just kidding. So it's, it's a really neat tool. And uh, now I'm going to show you how jhipster works and, uh, and all those tools I talked about. So there's two ways to actually do a jhipster application. I'm just going to warn you that um, if you don't see what I'm talking about up here on the screen, Chances are I forgot to switch my monitor back to, you know, mirroring. And uh, so just shout out or raise your hand and be like, hey, you forgot, Matt. So we'll turn it back on the mirror displays. There's the Volkswagen. Strange obsession, I told you. 
Hopefully I don't have to sell them and the kids go to college. <laughs> so I'm going to try something that I've never tried before in a live talk, so this should be fun. Um, we're going to create a new project using IntelliJ's Yeoman plugin. So what this allows you to do is allows you to do it via IntelliJ. So this is the prompts that you normally get from the command line or do, you're doing um, jhipster, but it's in IntelliJ. So we're just going to do a monolithic application. One of the new features in jhipster 3.0, which came out a couple months ago, is you can do microservices. So the best reason for microservices is not because microservices, it's because you have a team that needs to scale. Monolithic applications can scale just fine. But when you get up to 10 or 20 or 30 developers, like, it can be painful. So microservices are good when you need you know, teams of five or teams of 10 developing you know, a single service in your team. So um, that's why you would use microservices. And what this allows you to do is use a lot of the Spring Cloud tools to generate a normal back end you know, that's a single service. And then you can even have those you know, REST APIs on the back end. And then you have a gateway service that you know, puts them all together. And then you can generate the UI on that gateway. And so it talks to all those different backends. So we're going to do a monolithic application. Um, we're going to just call it a blog. Well, let me show you a little more in the presentation here. I explain it a bit more. So we're going to create a basic blog application. We'll look at how it's configured in some of the files you get by default. We'll generate the CRUD entities. And then we'll do some security features where when you generate these things, there's no like security built in. So we have blogs, we have entries. But everyone can see everyone, so we want to limit those. And we'll deploy it to Heroku. All in 20 minutes. So I got 34 minutes left. When I'm done, there should be 14 minutes left, right? So this is the entity diagram. This is what it looks like. We have a user. We have a blog with a name and a handle. We have an entry with title, content, and date. And we have a name for tags. OK, so we hide that. Default package name, orgj hipster blog. I'll just do the regular HTTP session authentication. Normally, I'd recommend you do it differently, right? Use JWT or OAuth2. And then social login. Sure, why not? Facebook, Twitter. Um, I'm going to do SQL, just because I know those better. Um, Postgres for the production database. And then we'll just use H2 for a development database. Um, hibernate second level cache with the H cache. Elasticsearch, no, I don't need it. Clustered HTTP sessions, no, thank you. Do you want to use WebSockets? Nope. I do, but browsers don't support them very well. Um, Maven or Gradle? I'm hip, right? I'm using Gradle, man. And then SAS, we'll use SAS. Um, internationalization, but we're only going to do English. We're just ready for the next one. And then we'll go ahead and use Gatling by default. And then it prompts us, do you want to run npm install in Bower? Yep. And then we'll just call this blog. OK, so one of the interesting things is I want to go in here and just show you right out of the bat what files it creates. So we use the tree command. And then in another window, I want to do clock so we can see the lines of code. So with the tree command, you can see all the files it generates, which is quite a few. There's no NPM module or no modules folder yet, so it's not that big. But you know, it's got a README, it's got Gradle support in there, it's got Gulp files, it's got Docker support. So one of the cool things about the microservices is you can actually Dockerize each one of those and start, you know, all of them at once on your machine with Docker Compose. Um, so we'll go into these Java files, but I'm just showing you kind of what's in here. For Liquibase, it's a great tool that actually creates your tables and your database for you and migrates between releases. So it can upgrade your tables, remove keys, add keys, delete keys. And then uh, you know there's some things we had to write for JSR 3.10. There's a few repositories in here for user management and then a number of files for, uh, for the JavaScript. And the JavaScript is really what takes up a lot just because of the patterns in Angular. They say you know, create a controller file. They say create you know, a template and uh, you know, have them for each different state. And in Java, what we've done over the last 20 years is we've figured out that you can put a lot of that code into frameworks like Spring. And so we end up with Java files that are only a few lines long. And then you know, the actual JavaScript is still raw JavaScript. And we have had some encouragement from the community to actually you know, libraryize, I guess, jhipster. 
So there's a jar or there's a JS file, right? And it is more of a framework. But my experience with AppView is I did that at one point and the community was like, no, like we don't want to upgrade our applications. We just want to start with them. And then we can upgrade and handle the dependencies from there. So um, I've been encouraging the project not to lock in users in that sense by creating those you know, JS libraries or those jar libraries. And that, because it's great, your project would be small, but then you don't really own the code that you generate. And this way, you own all the code. So we'll close that one down. And look at the, the lines of code created. You see we got Java, um, 6,000 lines, JavaScript, about 5,000, and a bunch of HTML, and there's even some DOS in there. Um, but if I ran this after a node does npm install, Holy cow, there's like a million lines of code. So um, if it's done here, which it looks like it is, I can, I can start that process and will remind me to check on it towards the end. So we'll import Gradle in here, choose Java 8. And while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and switch to a different profile here. Prezo guy. And uh, so there's this JDL Studio. That's a pretty slick project. Um, what it allows you to do is in the browser, you basically write your entity. So if I spelled something wrong here and you know tried to go to the next line, um, it should give me a warning. Maybe it's at the bottom. But if you, if you tried to work, it actually wouldn't work. But you can see here we have an entity blog. And this is basically jhipster domain language. We created our domain language. That's how we know we're a real project. JDL, baby. So blog name, string, and then you have an enti or entry with the title, content, and a date, and then a tag, and then you have the relationships. Many to one, a blog user login goes to user, and the blog name goes to blog. And so these are drop downs, right? If we have drop downs in an entity screen, this is what they'll look like. And then we have pagination on our entry screen, and our tag. So I'll put those up so you can see them a little better. And then you can see like the, the diagram over here. So since it's a uh, you know, web application, you just hit Command S, and it saves it. So now we have that. And before we import that, I'm going to go back to IntelliJ and make sure everything's working here. So because this is a Spring Boot application, we can just go to application, or actually it's called blog app now. And it has this really cool feature. I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this editor config file, um, if you have one of these in your projects, it'll configure most editors to do tabs versus spaces, indent style, um, indent size, and all that. And like Sublime recognizes it, um, Atom recognizes it, IntelliJ recognizes it. So you don't have to worry about your people getting out of sync on things so much. So that's kind of nice. And then you can say, hey, for you know, Bower and package JSON, we, we like two spaces. So that's kind of cool. So again, back to our blog app. We can just run this because it's Spring Boot. So we could run Gradle W if we wanted. Um, it does use Gradle Wrapper, but um, this tends to be a bit easier. So it, it creates our database because there wasn't one, and starts everything up. So now we can open that up in our browser. Oh, so this is what I wanted to show you. I actually lied to you. I haven't done this in a live demo, um, but I know that that generator from IntelliJ has some issues. So I, I have verified I know how to fix it. That's the good news. First of all, the one thing it does, just to let you know, is this enables social sign-in. If you select no, it defaults to no, and this is not understood by our generator. So that's why I chose true, so you wouldn't see that error. Um, and same thing with testing frameworks. If you choose Protractor in there as well, it'll actually only put in Gatling. So that's if you create it from IntelliJ. If you do it from the command line, from the command line you type yoj hipster, and it prompts you for all those same questions. It just it misses on a few things. Um, so what I've, what I've learned is you can basically do from the command line, you can go yo j hipster force. And so it recreates everything 
and uh, it seems to work better. So it fixes all the problem that, that IntelliJ 1 creates. But the problem is it does NPM install. Boring. But look, it didn't take that long. Did you hear about the bug in NPM where the status bar was slowing things down by half? So if you did NPM install, it'd take like five minutes. You do NPM set progress equals false, two minutes. Kind of funky. OK, did that succeed? OK, so if that succeeded, then this might succeed. Yep, there you go. So see, it's easy to fix. So this is what you get by default. You can sign in with admin admin or user user. So if we sign in with admin admin, we have no entities yet. But you can see we have, uh, we have our settings for administrator. You can change your password. There's user administration. There's metrics. So you can see what, uh, how many threads are being used, HTTP requests, statistics for calling certain methods, and EHCast statistics. So this is all provided by Spring Boot. We just put a nice UI on top of it. Help, if you want to see what's up. So if we configured email in here, that would, be, that would show here. Um, configuration, these are all the things that you can configure. So if you have an application.properties file from Spring Boot, you can go and modify these or override them. And then auditing, so it says I succeeded in logging in there. And then logs, you can actually tweak the logs um, in runtime. So you can say org, Spring Framework, um, give me more information. And then that'll actually tweak it with logback, and you'll actually see different messages in your console. And then there's API, you just swagger, so you can see all those if you want to send those to you know, people that you work with. If you just have UI developers, and then H2 disk. So um, that's what it looks like by default. And then from the command line here, we can do yo jhipster import jdl, and then point to that file. And then we're going to overwrite liquid base because we're adding some new tables. So now if we go back to our UI, ooh, too big, um, and we log in, you'll see that we actually have entities under there. But if you try to hit them, let's see, I don't think we can create a new one because the Java doesn't know that it's changed. But let's try it. Admins. Log, admin, we'll tie it to admin. No, that doesn't work. So um, you could either recompile it or I find it easier just to reload it. But if you did that same thing and you know we're using Eclipse and it recognized those changes and recompiled those files, then it wouldn't be an issue. IntelliJ usually you have to you know recompile them and then it knows to, to restart everything. So now we can go back here, hit save again. And now it created it. So now we can create a user's one. Give it a user handle. And now we have two of them. And we can even go create some tags. DevOx UK. VW. Java. Angular. We can create some entries. We won our first show. VWs are fun. And then it's got a little date picker here, so you can say that was May 20th. No? Oh, that's the 20th month, 15th. Mm, sure. That time, and then admins blog and VW. And then we can say we won again last weekend. But this is for the uh, this is for the user. So um, that was the fifth. Um, that was about 12 p.m. And we'll do it on the users. And again, VW. And then I am happy to be here. I am happy to be here. Drinking whiskey. You guys don't spell it with an e though, do you? You just do y. Yeah, it's weird. Or maybe we're weird, right? Yeah. That's true. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> ah, there you go. So now you see that we have a problem. We have, you know, someone can log in and, and basically see not only both blogs, but, you know, both entries. So to fix that, what we need to do is go into our service for blogs. We call it blog repository. 
or actually not blog repository, but blog resource. And you'll notice here if we get our structure menu going, oh well, um, get all the old fashioned way. That it just does a find all. So we need to change this to find by user as current user. Wow, IntelliJ just created that code for me. No, it didn't. It was already there. So when you create the relationship, that one to many, like we did, um, JHipster in generates this for you to by default. So it says, you know, select from blog where user login equals this. So then we can go back to our resource, compile it, and now Spring Boot restarts itself. We go here, and that's not the right one. It's in blogs, right? So now. If we log out, log back in as user, we only see our own. But if we go to entries, then we still have a problem, right? We haven't done it there, so we got to go to entry resource. And again, get all, sorry. And this time it's a little different. So we have to do find by blog user login order by date descending. Yeah, that's an easy method to remember. <laughs> so that was a shortcut that I had pre-recorded to, to make that. But basically, this is, uh, this is Spring Data, and it's JPA repository support that allows you to have method names that create HQL queries for you, or JPA queries. So um, we need to pass in the current user's login. There's a security utils, get current user login that you can use. And then you can go here and say, hey, IntelliJ, create that for me. It says, I'll do that. Thank you. And then you compile that one. Then you go back, compile this one. And then it catches both of them. And come back here and refresh. And there we go. Now it's just the user's blog. So one of the problems here is, uh, is we want to say something like some HTML in there. Right, and it doesn't escape it, so I want to escape it. So that's pretty easy with, uh, with Angular. You just go here and say, oh, this content here needs to be in an ng HTML bind, or bind HTML, and then it should show me HTML, right? Oh, here, we haven't done, uh, we haven't invoked gulp in browser sync yet, right? We're still doing just Spring Boot, so um, if you type gulp, then it does the browser sync stuff. And so now if I changed anything, it'll, it'll actually show me. So you can see here, oh, what happened? That's gone now. But then down here it says, hey, you're trying to do unsafe things with Angular, so stop it. But then you can say, OK, actually, I'm going to start it. You go here and you say, ng sanitize lets me do that. Sanitize. You say that, and then you go back, and there you go. So you notice it reloaded the browser for me. That was pretty easy. Um, and then we want to change this guy right, from that content to a text area, just because we're going to type a lot of stuff. So text area, take that out, take that out. Put a space in there. Now we go back. I need some more rows in there. Rows equals five. There we go. And you notice it actually comes back to that dialog. So it has that dialog in a state. Works pretty well. Um, the last thing is when we create a new entity or an entry, um, you'll notice it doesn't default to the current date. So I'm just going to go in there and to that entry dialog controller and basically say if VM entry date, or if not, VM entry date. If it's not defined, then VM entry date equals new date. Now you notice when we create one, oh, there we go. So only for new ones. No, entry, entity, sorry. NC entry, and now it has a date in there, right?
do it after this guy, VM. All right, well, that's a bad part of the demo, I guess. How are we doing? I got two minutes. So now you do yo, J hipster, Heroku, to deploy to Heroku. Um, we're going to call this uh, J hipster DevOx UK. That's a pretty unique name. We'll go in the EU. And this does take a little while, depending on you know how long it takes to upload, because it does upload this jar. So we'll see if it can beat my time here. I'm starting to feel pretty hip because you know made this whole application. Um, I'll, I'll show you as soon as this is done um, because it's got to do. Yeah, you can see it. So I got this bow tie, and this is the, the one thing in my outfit that I forgot on the way over here. And uh, the cool thing is, kind of hard to put on, but I ordered it yesterday. Found this service that could deliver it if I ordered it by 5 p.m. And so at 4:55. I went to order it online, and you know what it said? Credit card doesn't work. So I was like, well, I'll just try it again. It didn't work the second time either. So I tried a different credit card. That one didn't work, and I was getting nervous, right? I was like, holy cow. And uh, PayPal, right? They had a PayPal option, so I did PayPal. That worked. My time of ordering was 16.59.51. Here it is. Made it by noon today, so kudos to your delivery folks in the UK here. They made it happen. So yeah, we'll look at that, the size of the file. We might still have our clock going over here in that other window. Well, it looks like it got closed, but uh, if we look at blog, target, well, I guess it didn't create one. Oh, it's in build, right, with Gradle? Libs. So 48, 58 megs. Um, 48 before they added Tomcat in there. And then, you know, it ended up being 58. So it doesn't look like I made the 20 minutes. I blame the internet. But it'll upload and it'll be done by the time this presentation is done. I also got my uh, suspenders to match. <laughs> and it's funny, if you, uh, if you get this whole get up on Amazon, you know what it's called? Hipster nerd outfit, blue. <laughs> so J-Hipster has a number of tools you can use. Let me just put on this. Not just the ones I showed you, but obviously Eclipse and IntelliJ support. Um, there's a Vagrant J-Hipster development box, so if you don't want to install NPM or Yeoman, um, you can just download this you know, development box and start up as a VM. Um, Docker and Docker Compose, so it supports all that. It's just a simple command to create a Dockerized instance of your application. Um, the J-Hipster domain language and the JDL Studio, and J-Hipster UML. So if you like UML, first of all, I'm sorry you still have to be on WebSphere, and you use UML, but... It can actually use your tools and generate you know, code just like we did with the JDL Studio um, from many of the, the tools out there for UML. You already saw the JDL Studio, um, JHipster UML, um, Modelio UML Designer, GenMyModel is not free, Visual Paradigm, so you can use all those. There's also load testing with Gatling. Um, that's a pretty cool thing. And I went and searched and found your best beer, the London Porter, All right? So I'm about as hip as I can be at this point. So with Gatling, it actually does HTTP testing 
and you can use anything that goes over HTTP. So I did use Gatling to do a bunch of testing on SOAP services, and it was great because I worked for a client where they had this legacy thing on IBM, I forget what it was, and, uh, and we replaced it with Apache Camel. And we were actually able to test, load test the old system, and then load test the new system with existing data and find edge cases in where you know, we didn't handle the data correctly. So Gatling is a great way to say, hey, can you handle 2,000 users at once? Can you scale up you know, and handle all those users? And its feeders is a, is a great way to use existing data as your feed to you know, do that testing. Um, UI testing in JHipster, there's Jasmine and Protractor support. I wrote a blog post on how I added Protractor support, so if you're interested in that, that's out there. Um, there's a number of modules, so we have this marketplace where people can add support for things like Elasticsearch. Um, one of my clients right now is StormPath, and they do an API in the cloud. I might add you know, a module for that. Um, Swagger to markup if you actually want to generate documentation around your Swagger code, and even Ionic. So not Ionic 2, um, but Ionic 1 with regular Angular support. There is a module for that where you can generate entities for you know, an iPhone app. And we even have a way to create your own module where you can actually you know, start with a GitHub project. And then jhipster3, like I mentioned, um, based on Spring Cloud, uses JWT. There's a Docker image if you want to use that. Um, pluralization of generated entities, not a big deal, but um, when I would have generated this with entry before, it would have tacked on, or, or actually it was in another project of mine. If I had something that ended with an S, it would give it two S's, and now it recognizes you know, what an entity's name and what, what its plural name is and, and names those files appropriately. We did have a fast profile, but now with Spring Boot, they've done so many things to make that fast, we don't need it anymore. And we're using John Papa's style guide for AngularJS. So you know that your AngularJS code is, is just like you, know, you would want to write it. So with microservices, as I mentioned, you generate a gateway for web traffic and Angular UI, and then you use this jhipster registry that actually manages all your instances. You generate those apps in the back end. And then there's even a jhipster console that's built on Elk in the Elk stack, Elasticsearch, and uh, all those other ones, and just makes it you know, easy to monitor your application. And like I mentioned before, even if you don't use jhipster, there's a lot to learn from looking at one of its generated applications. Um, source maps, for instance, with JavaScript and CSS, that hasn't been easy for me to do, but we've done it in the jhipster project, so you can easily look at that and say, how'd they configure Gulp to configure and generate those source maps? And we even have it so with, with Gulp we can generate um, these little notifications up in the corner when your Gulp build fails, right? And so that's kind of a nice thing that maybe you went off and did something else and you know, it tells you about that. So I liked it so much that I wrote a book on it, the J Hipster mini book. It's written with ASCII Doctor and uh, it basically, I developed a real world app. I found out probably a year and a half ago, a friend of ours said, hey, do you and your wife want to do a, uh, a no sugar thing? Three weeks, no sugar. 21 day sugar detox. And we were like, okay. First day, we find out there's no booze. And we were like, what, what did we get ourselves into? But by the end of that three weeks, I've had high blood pressure for 20 years. And at the end of that three weeks, I did not have high blood pressure. And I ran out of high blood pressure medication in that first week. And I was like, well, it's pain in the ass to go to my doctor and get a new prescription, so I'm just going to screw it. Turns out, I didn't have it, so... I've been eating low sugar and exercising more and drinking less, three components, 21 points. You can get seven points per week for each one. So what I have is a system where you can earn three points a day. You earn a point if you don't drink. You earn a point if you exercise. And you earn a point if you don't eat sugar. So you can get 21 points in a week. My goal every week is usually 15. When I'm traveling, 10, right? <laughs> it's tough. So I don't travel that much. Um, except for conferences and stuff. And uh, you can download the book from InfoQ. It's free. And we're working on a print version. Actually, do have a copy here. If you want to take a look at the print version, it's, uh, it's 8 and a half by 11, so we're working on reducing that down to 6 by 9. Um, but you can see all the code and content in it. And I need to update it for jhipster3. It's still relevant, but I'll be updating it in like, the next couple of weeks. Maybe uh, you know, by July it'll be done for the new version. So just to show you the lines of code in, in 21 points um, when I created this application, it's out there at 21-points.com. Uh, the project when it was created was like 8,500 lines, and then I generated the entities to you know, track the, the blood pressure. I also track weight 
and then I track you know how many points you get a day. Um, and that was about 12,700 lines. And then the business logic, like what I actually need to do to make it look good and make it work, was only 1388. So it took me about 1,000 lines of my time, my code, to actually make it into something I wanted. And granted, it could be better, um, but it got me the bare minimum of where I wanted to go, which is great for MVPs and products like that. And if you look at lines of code by language, it kind of you know, stays the same as you go. Um, Java, JavaScript are, are almost equivalent, and then a bunch of HTML in there. So if you want to learn more, um, Java Hipster, follow them on Twitter. Um, go to the website. There's also a GitHub, uh, obviously, repository. You can learn about Angular from AngularJS. If you go to YouTube, that last link is, is this talk at DevOps Belgium in November. And uh, same thing, um, less mistakes, and uh, went pretty well. So if you want to share that with friends, you can. Um, to get help, we actually don't recommend that you put something in our issue tracker. It's better to just ask on Stack Overflow. Or we actually have Gitter IM, same thing, right? Go to that and chat instead of entering issues. Just it's easier for us to help you in real time. Everyone gets notifications from Stack Overflow if you tag a question. Um, if you want to contribute to the project, um, I've had a great experience doing that. You go and read our contribution guide. And we have a development mailing list if you want to see what we're talking about and some of the plans for Angular 2 that just started happening this week. So if you have any questions, I'll take those now, but you can also stay hip by following me online. I'll post this presentation to SlideShare, um, maybe today, maybe tomorrow. And then uh, the code for 21 points is on GitHub, um, so you can see that, and jhipster blog. So I did a screencast of the same thing I did here, and that's up there with source code. If you go to uh, jhipster's website and you click on videos, you can watch it there too. It's about 20 minutes long. So does anyone have any questions? If I just sit here silent long enough, someone will ask one. Did it, yeah, good question. Did Heroku work? Let's see. <coughs> Heroku open. Oh, Mirit. There it is. JHipsterDevOps, Heroku.com. Sign in. There we are. So there's no data, right? Because it doesn't upload your data. And we're using Postgres here instead of the other one. You can see there's, there's everything that ended up working. And uh, it looks like it took 5 minutes and 18 seconds total. Um, obviously, that's faster if you have a faster internet. And you can do Heroku tail logs. And there's all the output of what I just did. So thanks for coming. <laughs>